Back to me finding hidden little gems in Steam, and I actually came across this game. It's called Dagon by everyone knows H.P. Lovecraft, and it seems to be like one of those visual click novel type of games. So very excited. It looks creepy. Background is a little ominous. So let's get started, shall we? Okay. Dagon is a fateful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work, focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here, and movement is limited to progressing through locations along with the plot. Sounds good. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. During the game, you will encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden in order to find these secrets. Focus your eyes and look for the Elder Sign. Okay, so right click. Okay. Um, yeah. There we go. Lovecraft's letters. As to letters, my case is peculiar. I write such things exactly as easily and as rapidly as I would utter the same topics in conversation. Indeed, epistolary expression is with me largely replacing conversation. As my condition of nervous prostration becomes more and more acute, I cannot bear to talk much now, and I am becoming as silent as the spectator himself. My loquacity extends itself on paper. H.P. Lovecraft to Reinhard Kleiner, December 23rd, 1917. Throughout his life, Lovecraft penned around 100,000 letters to his friends and fans, out of which about 10% survived to this day. But his tendency to endless correspondence was a relatively late growth. In youth, I scarcely did any letter writing, thanking anybody for a present was so much of an ordeal that I would rather have written a 250 line pastoral or a 20 page treaty on the rings of Saturn. Selected letters 1929 to 1931 H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft would often skip meals to afford postage. Collections of his correspondence have been published in various books and selected letters can be found online. Some readers consider them his most important legacy. Okay. You can read the discovered trivia immediately or go back to them later in the main menu. Turn off displaying trivia if you find that the feature distracts you from the story. This can be changed anytime in the options. No, I, I like the trivia. Wait, do show trivia upon finding them. Yeah, I want to see him. Okay. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Morphine. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administrated to treat severe pain during the American Civil War 1861 to 1865 and World War I 1914 
to 1918. It was almost sold without restrictions until 1914. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1854. Friedrich Serturner, I apologize if I butchered your name, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium, after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. Huh, never knew that. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. Right, there's one more. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. I'm assuming we look at here. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the fifth century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos, and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on 27 July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited, just as a thousand years just as a thousand years ago the Huns under their king Attila made a name for themselves. One that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross eyed at a German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the law and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Convention, Convention of 1899. Interesting. Okay. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. Um. Okay, nothing here. Oh. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. Um, I, the moon. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days, I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. Still better water graphics than God of War. The new one, just saying. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. 
The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. <laughs> okay! Oh my gosh! When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. I would be too, sir. I would be too. For there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. Chat Place, thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for joining. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. It looks like a desert now. Behind me looks like a desert. Okay. Um. The origins of Dagon. Dagon seems to be inspired by Fishhead, a short novel by Irvin S. Cobb about unnatural affinities between a hybrid idiot and the strange fish of an isolated lake in brackets, supernatural horror in literature, H.B. Lovecraft. Okay. And Lovecraft's dream about a strange island emerging from the ocean and he him crawling in the ooze that covered its surface. I dreamed that whole hideous crawl and can yet feel the ooze sucking me down in defense of Dagon H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft's interest in the topic stemmed from his aversion to fish and sea smells in his own words. I have hated fish and feared the sea and everything connected with it since I was two years old but I cannot recall what earlier experience gave me such a profound and lasting aversion to the sea and seafood. The Dweller in Darkness, Lovecraft, 1927, Donald Wondre. The ocean is very ominous. I mean, I've always been gravitated to the ocean and the water, but I can see having fear what is it? You're an octopus. You're an alien. You are calamari. Okay, let's look here. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, 
and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. Oh. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. What's this? Part of the boat, I reckon. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Mm. Okay. All day oh. I forged steadily westward guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. Yeah, it was a desert. Looks like gold and aliens. Okay. Um, that's a sperm whale? I reckon a blue whale or a sperm whale. These are crab alien creatures. That night I encamped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. And you are... The Kraken. That's exactly what you are. Okay. Okay, there's nothing else here. So let's go forward. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Perspiration. That's how you pronounce it. I always pronounce it as Prespiratorian? Perspiration? Oh. English is not my first language, so forgive me. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon, I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Oh, not a bag. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. That was very creepy. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual.
urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze. I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. That's no stone, sir. That's alien mirror. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. Like that. It filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. Okay. Um, I don't see... Can I walk? I can't walk. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith. Why do I have goosebumps? I have goosebumps. On whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. Oh. Uh, the writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. This is nice. This is pretty. I like this. That seahorse on the far right? Um, I have that tattooed, and that's actually from a HP Lovecraft book on how he described a seahorse. I have that. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world. Kraken. But whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Kraken. Storytelling methods. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness, the Nameless City, journals and character notes, the Shadow Out of Time, the Haunter of the Dark, Islands Emerging from the Ocean, the Call of Cthulhu, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies, me go in the whisperer in darkness. It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's skip the details in order to not to spoil the ending. Nice! Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs 
Blue's subjects would have excited the envy of a Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail. I don't want to know either. For the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Yep, Grotesque that's not... beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Mermaid. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Oh, oh! The Piltdown Man. Lovecraft would often use the latest scientific discoveries as inspiration for his work. He would even update his stories at the last moment in order to make sure they reflected the latest breakthroughs. Unfortunately, this method was not without its flaws. After Lovecraft's death, the Piltdown Man discovery mentioned in Dagon turned out to be a I don't know if I can pronounce this word. Let's try. <laughs> pa Paleoanthropological fraud. Paleoanthropological fraud. We did it! In 1912, Charles Dawson, an amateur ar archaeologist, announced that he had discovered the missing link between ape and man. Charles Darwin? The fossilized remains of a previously unknown early human. Years later, they turned out to be a forgery. But by that point, the fraud had already managed to negatively affect the early research of human evolution. In the year when the discovery took place, the majority of the scientific community believed Dawson indeed found the missing link. In 1953, Time magazine published evidence pro proving that Dawson was a con man. It turned out that the fossils of the previously unknown early human consisted of a human skull, the joy of an orangutan, and chimpanzee teeth. I'm curious, do they mean Charles Dawson as in Charles Darwin? I'm not too familiar because I don't really um, believe in human evolution, so I'm just a little bit curious on that. But um, yeah, let, let's continue. Okay, um... Nothing more. Okay. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. What we saw? I got goosebumps. What did. Oh, oh! With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. <laughs> it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the marlin, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Uh, I would go mad too. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. Oh, oh. Okay. Um. Um. Okay. I believe I sang a great deal, 
and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. <laughs> I sing too when I'm scared. Um, nothing? Okay. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Nothing to view. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Oh, 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 that's one. The journalist. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again for the first time since his teenage years. Dagon, published in 1919, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this example excerpt from The Conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can phantom, fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm one or more nations would undoubtedly re retain secret armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. Very true. Okay. Um, let's continue. I think we're nearly done. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Dagon. Dagon, Dagan, was the main deity of the Philistines worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for grain. The ruler of Akkad, Mesopotamia, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison warder in one of the Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretation of his name as in Hebrew, the word dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's work, Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the Deep Ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that reside in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called 
the es esoteric order of Dagon. Mermaids, I reckon. Um, anything more for us to discover? No. Here. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. August Der Derleth and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derleth was an American writer and anthologist. An anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company Arkham House. Oh, okay. Although he greatly contributed to the popular popular ha popularization of the author's work after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine. Derleth was a devout Catholic to the Cthulhu mythos, which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misinterpreted in today's culture. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu mythos was coined by Derleth after the author left the mortal plane. Interesting. The marketer. Marketer? Lovecraft's attempt to find a job in 1925 were influenced by advice he received from friends, among others. He started freelancing for a marketing magazine, where he would write announcements and commercials. Feel free to judge his copywriting skills for yourself. From an ad from Curtis Woodwork. Curtis Woodwork embraces both the unusual structural units and the cleverest contravances of built-in or permanent furniture, such as bookcases, dresses, buffets, and cupboards. Every model is conceived and created with the purest art, ripest scholarship, and mellowest craftsmanship, which energetic enterprise can command, and made to conform rigidly to the architecture of each particular type of home. The cost, considering the quality, is amazingly low, and a trademark on the individual pieces prevents any substitution by careless contractors. Source Lovecraft Studios, Volume 7, Number 1, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, St. Joshi or St. Joshi? Aha, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to turn around and there's going to be something there waiting for me. Like, hello, you should be a bed. You should be in bed. Nothing? Nothing? Ah, oh, I see you. The scientist. <coughs> These days, the word scientist is a widely accepted term. But at the time Dagon was, pub the Dagon was published, it was subject to a wide debate. After the author used it in the story, critics pointed out that man of science was a more appropriate term to employ. He admitted in, in defense of Dagon that if Dagon were to be reprinted, he would indeed use the phrase they suggested. Scientist was coined as an analogue to artist to be used when re ref referring to those studying different branches of science. Yet, in the 19th and early 20th century, scientific researchers in Great Britain and the United States were on the opinion that man of science, resembling the term man of letters, was the only proper choice, among other things. It was gender-specific, indicating that science was an end um, endeavor to be pursued by only one sex. Huh. The term scientist became more accepted only after World War II 
and man of science started fading into obscurity as an old-fashioned synonym. Interesting. Okay. Uh, nothing here. Yeah. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I'll be I tried the thing. morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft on tobacco and alcohol. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with friend Reinhard Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Zealia Brown, dated 13 February 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicate, intoxicating liquor and never intend to. Having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or courses, coarsens the delicate natural equ equipoise of the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal repugnance, hence I don't drink. Let the herd do what they will. I am rather in favour of prohibition, the prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as of any other. Source: The Spirit of Revision, Lovecraft's letter, Lovecraft's letter to Zelia Brown, Reed Bishop, H. P. Lovecraft, Sean Brainy, and Andrew Leman, S. T. Joshi. Well, too easy zone, I guess. Okay, let's look at the morphine. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Godzilla! the door Wow. 
okay. Um, thank you for joining me. It, this was a, a lot more than I initially expected. I just thought it was, you know, text-based. You read and then you click. Um, a lot of very nice fun facts. I, I do apologize that uh, my reading of the, the text and the, the little discoveries weren't as good. English is not my first language and um, pronouncing certain words can be a little bit of a chore for me as well. There are certain like TH and certain words that um, I, I don't pronounce. Um, thank you Jetplace, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that was a fast game. I think it's what but 45 minutes but uh it was it was very very scary i did get quite a bit of goosebumps but uh again thank you for for joining me thank you jet place for for watching and for subscribing as well i look forward to um any of you that want to join to me again tomorrow around the same time till then bye